day one. Um, it'll be good for me to get it off my chest and I hope that it'll be helpful to you as well. So I want to talk about meltdowns with um, an autistic individual or not even just an autistic but a special a special needs child and the difference between a meltdown and what a, a typical tamper, temper tantrum would look like. So with, with a typical temper tantrum, you're usually dealing with a behavior that is willful and defiant and um, it's easily recognizable because you most often see it in toddlers or preschoolers. Um, with, with a meltdown with an autistic child or a special needs child, it's different because it's, it's really an involuntary um, coping mechanism to cope with the sensory overload that they're experiencing. It's like um, blowing a breaker, actually, when we, we actually have an outlet in the kitchen where we have our microwave um, plugged into. But if we plug anything else into that, to that outlet, we're going to blow the breaker 10 out of 10 times. It's an overload. And that's really basically what a meltdown is, too, for, for Koi and for children with special needs. And so <clears throat> over the years, we've had horrific meltdowns. And um, we've done our best to learn how to um, stop them. Um, we Sometimes we get lucky enough that they will stop quickly, that we can change directions real quickly. And other times, there's just no stopping it and we don't know how to handle it and we don't know how we don't know what to do in that environment or that situation and um that's where i want to talk to you today about i received a message a couple weeks ago from from yet another um family that we don't even know but they are friends of friends of ours and our friends had said hey you know i really want you to get in touch with the tomlins i think they might be able to to help you through this situation and um we we've had our fair share of meltdowns over the years, and um, <clears throat> they haven't ended. They've gotten better, um, mostly because we're able to be one step ahead of the meltdowns in some situations, like Koi hates rain, and um, it, he gets scared to death at thunder and lightning storms, and that is a sensory overload for him, and so there's usually a big meltdown with that. Well, that's an easy thing to, to, to pre prepare for. You just look at the weather channel, and if there's a storm coming, then we're not going to that baseball game, or we're not going to go to that outdoor event, because we already know that there's a 100% there's a chance that Koi will have a meltdown at the first lightning strike or thound, sound of thunder. But we had one back in December that we had no way of preparing for whatsoever. And it was the worst one we have ever been through with him. We um, had had the opportunity to take a fun little weekend to Washington, D.C. Uh, just before Christmas. We were really looking forward to it. We had been locked in like most of you because of COVID. Um, Koi's not going to wear a mask. So the mandates really, you know, uh, locked us in this whole time. But most of our life is on a baseball field anyway, so it didn't really matter. We, we don't really go anywhere other than a baseball field, and he, he, there was no mandates for him to be on the baseball field you know, with his dad with, with having to wear a mask, so we've been okay. But this was, a, was meant to be a really, really fun thing. I had seen um, through an advertisement that the Washington Nationals do what's called enchantment around Christmas time, the entire month of December. And what they do is they take, um, make a maze of Christmas lights on their infield and outfield up at Nationals Park. Well, two things, two things in my favor. Number one, Koi loves Nationals Park. He loves baseball and he loves going up there. Number two, he is thrilled about Christmas lights. It's his favorite thing, he loves them. How the heck could this have gone wrong? But I'm going to tell you all, it was a nightmare. It was one of the hardest, no, it was the hardest melt, meltdown that I've been through with him, that we've all been through with him. Uh, we went ahead and bought the tickets. The tickets were, you know, they were expensive. It's not, a, it's not a cheap thing to do that. And we bought them for all the family. We were so excited. We coordinated outfits for family pictures and selfies because I love selfies. Um, the, the meltdown actually started first thing in the morning Saturday because we woke up and it was raining here in Lynchburg. And we're three hours from DC. And Randy was monitoring the weather and he was showing Koi the whole time that it was gonna be clear, that he wasn't gonna to have to worry about the weather in DC. 
It was colder than we thought, and so we needed to put Coy in jeans. He could not wear athletic shorts, and that was an issue. That started the meltdown. He absolutely hates wearing anything other than athletic shorts. And it's a, it's a sensory thing for him, too. You know, I don't think he likes the feel of it. He'll wear it, but it's not going to be his first choice. And so we negotiated that um, you could wear your athletic shorts in the car ride up to DC. We would go to the hotel first, and then you would change and put on warm clothes to be able to go do this fun thing at night with our with us. And that was that was okay. That that settled things. Uh, we took two cars because we didn't want to have the big expedition up there trying to park in, in downtown DC because that was part of the plan. We were gonna go early enough so that we could walk around DC because that's my favorite thing to do. And we wanted to have two smaller cars uh, to, you know, we'd have a better chance of parking at the monuments and things. And so I was supposed to ride initially with Koi, but it didn't work out that way. I ended up in the car with Tyler, Ellie, and the baby, and then Randy, Koi, uh, Quaid, and Allie went in a different car. So he was a little bit uptight about that because I think he thought it was going to be mommy, daddy, Koi, and one car and everybody else in another car. And that just wasn't going to work. And so we were battling that on the way up. Um, we get to D.C. and he's hungry, so we go ahead and eat. And the weather's fine. The weather's actually mild. It's it's misty, but it's not raining and it's not treacherous by no means. Uh, we needed light jackets, so it wasn't like anybody had to bundle up because that makes him feel uncomfortable as well. And we go to eat, and um, then we start making our way downtown to downtown D.C. and course there's traffic and Koi hates traffic he has road rage big time uh, but they were able to calm him down and as we got into the city they could point out different things that he would recognize uh, the Washington Monument and stuff like that and we were looking for a place to park and you know it was already getting dark and he was increasingly getting more agitated and so we just you know okay let's just go to the stadium we we had tickets but we weren't supposed to be there until about 7 30 and we thought you know let's just take a chance we'll go and we'll see if we can get in because we've never been so we didn't know so we go and we um we even picked a parking garage there was not going to be any problems with parking we didn't want any kind of frustration or anything that would cause any kind of you know overstimulation for him and so we we had the parking garage tickets we went and we pulled in, we pulled in side by side, and um, I can hear Quaid and Randy telling Coy, you know, you need to get out of the car, let's go. And um, he's just, I could hear him just yelling, no, he, he wanted to stay in the car, that he wanted us to go, but he was going to stay in the car. And so I go over to assist with him, and I'm like, Coy, you know, come on, it's time to go see the, the baseball field. And he said, no, Coy stay, Coy stay, you go. Much like when we run into uh, the Shell gas station to pick up a drink or something, I, I don't make him get out of the car for that 30 seconds. He waits in the car. Well, he had it in his mind. He was gonna wait in the car for the four hours that we went to the to the maze. And um, so I asked him, you know, Coy, you know, this is important to mom and you said you would come. And so I want you to get out of the car and come with us. Well, he said he couldn't because he had the virus that's his favorite go-to is he always likes because he knows that that's a real thing so he knows that hey I can't go I have the virus that's legit you can't make me go and I said Koi you don't have the virus nobody has the virus you're not even coughing and then he said he couldn't go he went directly to his leg being broken he couldn't go because he couldn't walk and I said Koi you broke your leg when you're 11 that's, that's a very long time ago and so he gets out of the car and um, we're in the parking garage and there's other families parking you know, and he's in the middle of the parking garage and he throws himself down on the pavement and screaming like, you know, like I actually had just broken his leg. And of course, that creates a lot of attention. You know, bystanders see that and they're curious and they want to know what's happening. And um, so we were getting some stairs and I went over to him. I helped him up and said, buddy, I know your leg's not broken. And I want you just to trust mom that you're going to love this. This is going to be fun. We're at Nats Park, you know, the Nationals baseball and uh, nothing was calming him down. And as he proceeded to limp, like he was um, wounded at war, it was awful. I mean, he really could have gotten an Oscar for his performance of thinking his leg was broken. And um, I mean, he was just limping and falling forward and crying real tears that his leg was broken and he couldn't walk. Well, we have realized in these situations that the best thing to do is not to to go back and get in the car and take him home because that just that just builds a a behavioral warehouse for him that hey the next time I don't want to do any do something 
um, and there will be a next time. I'm just going to pull this broken leg. They're going to put me in the car and I'm going to go home. It, it becomes a habit for them. And, and I don't want that to ever happen. And so we keep going forward. Even if it's a step at a time, we just keep moving forward. And so, you know, we've got uh, my, my other children were there, Tyler and Ellison and the baby, um, Quaid and Allie, they had just gotten married. And it was kind of like our, a, a fun Christmas thing to do. And so everybody was kind of, okay, mom, you know, this is not getting better. It's getting uglier by the second, you know, um, let's just get back in the car and we'll just, just call it, call it a night and cancel it. And, and, um, we were like, no, you know, I've been looking forward to it. We've, we've all been inside and we just knew once we could get him to the stadium that everything would be fine. He just was not able to understand and process what we were doing and, and where we were. So we're walking through the parking garage and there's, when you go down the stairs, uh, he, he hates elevators, by the way, so the elevator was not an option. So we were walking down the stairs and there was an opening in the stairs where you could look out and see the field. No good, not at all. I, I was anticipating joy and excitement and then him getting rid of his injury and running to the gates and that seemed to have made things even worse. And so we're limping, you know, limping around the outside of the stadium, going up to the certain gate we needed to go to and um, he wouldn't go through the gate, which was alarming naturally to the security people there in the front of the stadium. You know, why is this adult, normal looking man throwing himself on the ground, screaming that he has a broken leg? And so um, we, we were approached, I was approached actually several times. The kids kind of just went through ahead of him because sometimes it's best just to just to keep moving. And when everybody starts bombarding him and trying to, to help, it just creates more sensory overload for him. So Tyler and Ellison and the baby went through, uh, Quaid and Allie went through, but Quaid actually got held up because of a belt buckle or something going through the, um, the security thing. And so I was, uh, trying to divert attention to Coy and just get him into the gate. And I just kept pointing out, you know, there's a bench in there. We just got to get through this gate. We'll go sit on the bench, which I intended on doing with him. And the security lady was kind of like, you know, what, what's the deal with this? You know, what, what are you doing? And I explained, you know, he's autistic and we've never done this before. So we're trying to giving it a try. We've traveled three hours to do this. I think he's going to be fine once he gets in. Well, she seemed okay. So she was like, okay, well just let us know if you need anything. And so we get in and I go sit in front of the bench, like I told him, and we were talking through things. I was, you know, going through what we were going to do. I was explaining where we were at and I just wanted him to go see the baseball field. I was just like, Koi, I just want you to walk in like we would if we were at a baseball game. I want you to go look at the field and see all the lights. And so he got up and he started to limp again. And um, it was just he and I. And Randy was tending to everybody else. And it was just he and I. And he, he threw himself down on the ground again and was just crying. And of course, by this time, it's not two or three people in the parking garage. It's about a million people on the concourse of Nationals Park Stadium. And so um, immediately get approached by a security guard. And the security guard is not so sure of things. And he's like, you know, has he been drinking? <laughs> I wanted to laugh, but it actually made me cry. And I was like, no, sir, he's not drinking. He's an autistic adult and he doesn't really want to be here right now. We're trying to work through this. And he just, without realizing, he was just like, well, then why do you have him here? And, you know, at that point, I thought to myself, as I started to cry, I really don't know what, what I'm doing here, sir. I was hoping this was going to be a, a really great family trip and, and the first 10 minutes have been hell and I don't see it getting any better. And so um, I told him, I said, we, I just need to get him to a place where he can sit down and I can calm him down. And so he just, you know, he was just like, okay, well, you know, just be cautious of everybody, you know, or be considerate of everybody. And I'm like, ah. I understand all those things. And so I walked over to the bathroom and I told Koi, which he often waits for me outside of a woman's restroom. Um, no problems at all. I, I sat him down. I said, Koi, mom's got to go use the bathroom. I just need you to stay right here. Do not move. And um, he sat down and he was fine. And so I went into the bathroom and I went into a stall and I just started to cry. And I was sobbing and I was praying at the same time. And I was just like, God, I just need your help because this was meant to be the best family time for us. We don't ever get to do anything. And now we've been <clears throat> given an opportunity to come up here and I know he will enjoy it. And I'm crying and crying and crying. And the poor lady in the stall next to me, she says, sugar, I don't know what you need, but you just tell me and I'll do whatever you need. If you need to stay in here, I'll stay in here with you. And 
And um, she said, you just keep calling on that name. You keep calling on that name. He hears you. He hears you. And I think she was starting to cry too. And I told her I was okay. I just haven't. I just needed to be away from a situation just to regain my thoughts and to figure out a strategy to, to help the situation and to help my family. And um, so I come out of the, the bathroom and uh, Coy's sitting on the ground like I had asked him to. And I picked him up. And um, do you know there was an usher? He had seen Coy. We had walked by him and he had seen Koi fall on the ground and he had picked up on me crying and he could see that I was struggling and that Koi was struggling. And so he motioned for me to come over um, because they're in this enchant. Nobody's allowed to sit in the stands. It's, everything's roped off. And then there's only one way down to the field and one way back up the field. Um, so everything was roped off. Nobody could sit in the stands. And he motioned for me to come over. He said, you know, my name's Amos. And um what can I help you with? What do you need help with? And I just started to cry. I'm like, I know God just puts you in this situation that you're the angel I just prayed about in the bathroom with the lady next to me. And he said, you come over here and sit. You just sit right here. And he let us sit in the handicap section that was right there. And um, so what we decided to do was um, the other kids joined us because they had no idea what had happened or where I'd gone, if I was even in jail by that point. So they caught up with us. And um, I went through the maze with, um, I, I started out with Ellie, Sage, and Tyler, Allie, and, and Quaid. And um, Randy sat up there with Coy. And then once I walked through the maze, then Randy was going to go back through with the kids too. And um, didn't really end like, like we wanted it to. We didn't get to go together as a family. And um, we didn't get to take cute pictures. And the pictures that we did take, uh, Tyler and Ellie were just trying to keep me from busting out in tears. Because it really was supposed to be an important thing for me. Um, I work all day. And um, I don't get to travel much because of Koi's needs. And so it, it was more or less a, a mom treat too. Like they know how important family things are. And they know that I don't get to do a lot of it all the time <clears throat> and everybody was really disappointed and frustrated at this point because uh, we all had to go our separate ways um but randy said well he was up there uh, amos was um you know asking koi a whole bunch of questions and uh, koi was still wanting to get up and leave a hundred times uh, uh, koi done koi done ready to go but but this usher was asking him about baseball and who his favorite players were and randy was able to share about koi playing for the nats and about knowing steven strasberg and uh koi telling him that he was going to strike out bryce harper and so we had a downtime and then i went through and then randy went through and um when I was up there with with Koi, uh, Amos said, Koi, you know, why, why don't you want to go down to the field and look at the lights? And Koi pointed at the ice skating rink on third base. And he said, really agitated, ice skate rink on third base. And uh, he said, you don't like that ice skating rink on third base? And no, no, baseball field, baseball field. And then the 100 foot Christmas tree on the mound really wasn't helping the situation either. But we were able to stay almost for four hours. And once Koi calmed down and um, could really process all the information. So he knew he was going to Nationals Field. He knew that's where we were going to go. And he knew there was going to be Christmas lights involved. But I do got to tell you, in his autistic mind, the fact that there was an ice skating rink on third base was a huge issue to him. And the fact that there was a 100-foot Christmas tree on the pitching mound was another huge uh, issue for him. He was trying to process that information, trying to understand, you know, why why those things were on the baseball field. And he just had a meltdown and it was a terrible meltdown. He couldn't figure out anything to the point that he didn't even want to enjoy anything. Um, as he sat there and was able to just relax his mind, he started to laugh like at the person who fell ice skating. That was funny. He said, E5 you know, error, third baseman. Um, so he, he did start to relax. And then before we left, he really enjoyed walking into the team store and we kind of walked a little bit around the concourse um, and, and he was calming down. But, you know, with, with all the people there and with the field being uh, messed up with Christmas lights, it, it was just too much for him and it was awful. Uh, we kept going. I don't know if I did it right. I don't you know, I don't know if I made the right decisions that night at all. Um, didn't end up to be as fun of a family trip as I had been praying it would be. But um, 
It was a learning experience and we got through and uh, we probably won't make that trip up during Christmas time again. So we learned a lesson, but um, these meltdowns are hard and there's a really good chance that you're watching this video and you've seen, you've been in a, you've been out in the community and you've seen a family struggle with, with a meltdown. And, um, as a bystander, I just don't want to call on you to be an Amos. Okay. Just, um, we're doing the best we can do with them. If we could, uh, predict them, we probably wouldn't have been in the situation anyway. They can't be predicted. They just happen. And Koi lives in prison enough. There's enough things that he can't do because of his autism that we try to, to do new things with him, you know, all the time to, to get him to engage. And sometimes they fail miserably, like this, this failed miserably. But I'm so thankful for Amos and his timing and being there and the angel that he was. And you can be that for another family too. And, um, Amos said something to me as we were up there talking and he said he didn't know any autistic individuals. And he said, but the next time I see one Koi, I'm going to remember you. And that just made me cry too, because I thought here God, here God shows up. And this is an incredibly terrible situation for our family. It was a horrible night, but yet God in the future will use it because Amos will at a different time see another autistic child and he will remember Koi. And I bet he remembers his conversations with Koi. And I bet he remembers um, how they were looking at pictures and how easily he could distract Koi from the sensory by pointing out different things. So um, to my friend on Messenger, I know that birthday party was important to you. And I know that the meltdown hurt and that you didn't understand it and your family probably didn't understand it. And I know you probably felt like everybody was staring at you. I want you to know they are hard, but keep going. Take little steps. Um, try to, to re replay it back in your head of did, were there any warning signs? You know, did you see it coming? Was there any trigger points? That's another thing too. I just wish we knew a trigger point. Like what triggers it? We don't know. They just happen. Um, don't ever quit. And I didn't quit. And because I didn't quit, I really think that uh, we got stronger as a family. And um, don't quit, don't give up, uh, keep moving through it, keep talking through it. And um, that's about it, because I'm probably gonna start crying. <laughs> All right.